We have four artists speaking tonight. So this is our second ever alumni exhibition. Um, the first one was many, many years ago. And this is hopefully a tradition that we're going to start doing more frequently. Uh, so tonight we have four artists that were students here that got their associate's degrees here in arts and have gone on, gotten BFAs. Most of them also got MFAs. They're all working artists that are achieving a lot and creating really exciting work. Um, and we're just really excited to have them here tonight. So because there are four, we're only going to have a lot of feedback. Down. Okay, maybe that's better. That's better. Yeah. Okay, good, good. So since there are four, we're going to have everyone speak for roughly like 10 minutes so that the whole thing doesn't become too long. And then there will be time for questions. So I think it makes the most sense. Everyone talks. They'll be right here. Then we'll have like a few minutes for questions for whatever artist you want from the four. And then if you have more questions afterwards, they're not running out of here. You can go back in, you can look at the work, and it's a great opportunity to speak to someone that was, as a student, was in your shoes and has a lot of insights for you. So our first artist that's going to speak tonight is an artist who not only was a student here, and now she also is teaching here, so first semester of her teaching with us, Natalie Alfonso. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. This is so scary, but I love doing it. So <laughs> I will feel uncomfortable for the first 30 seconds, and then I hope everybody can see the images on the TV. I don't know if they're clear enough, but I kind of have previously prepared a really quick presentation. It's a six-minute presentation that overviews the work that I've done since 2011, more or less. So I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to try to be precise and concise, uh, concise about what, uh, the words that I'm presenting. So, here we go. Growing up, I had a tremendous desire to, do, to be awake all the time. My parents had a very challenging time putting me to bed at night or keeping me asleep late in the mornings. I remember having the urge to see every single thing happening around me. What we developed strategies to is that energy. At the age of nine, I started training speed walking on track and field. During 10 years, that practice kept my body moving and tied to routines of extreme order and repetition. Moving from point A to point B with a particular goal grew as an obsession. My coach used to tell me that training was painful, so the competition was easier. I never really understood this. Physical pain was always present and very rarely presented to the audience. Later on, my failed career as a professional athlete brought me to negotiate life in unexpected ways. When moving to the United States at the age of eight, I became a worker in different fields from cleaning houses to working as an art preparator or art handler. The works that I have produced since 2014 present notions of invisible labor, repetition, and endurance to the, through the use of drawing, installation, performance, and video. In 2014, I conceived my first, I think it's this one, actually, my first uh, line work. It's called Hidden Marks of Exhaustion. I've performed several iterations and the shape remains the same, but the length of the line changes depending on the location. Before each performance, I draw directly on the wall a clean, thick line out of charcoal. Viewers encounter the boldness and the fine line before I proceed to erase it. These actions attempt to dissolve the line, although the vigorous act of cleaning. The performance ends as I have the performance ends when I have succeeded in partially erasing the line. 
Most simply through this work I explore notions of invisible labor, physical endurance through both mark making and cleaning. My personal biography reveals a type of vulnerability to the mind and my labor in making it. I have come in contact with the challenges of the mind inside the gallery, opening up conversations around the immaterial value of performance and notions of my place, of my place within this structure. My performance has evolved from a linear act into an open-ended bracket, a way to harness non-essential information as a tool for future making. William Kentry said, to write like Beckett, one must be Beckett. I depart from this idea considering my urge to understand the drawn line in relationship to labor. If the drawn line is the only way I have to inform labor, how do I do it? Do I represent labor to others or do I perform labor? I traveled to Guatemala to observe and learn from Trama Textiles, a community of weavers. Initially, my intention was to learn how to craft my own rags for my line works. However, once there, this not longer felt like the right approach. What I discovered instead is that I could learn from the way weavers understand materials and endurance. Always thinking about notions of labor, I learned not to weave, but the impeccable work ethic of all these women that have by sitting in the same position to finish a textile. My drawings are not the record of that impeccable endurance. On the contrary, they are a glimpse of a moment where my hand followed but not replicated the represented labor. Continuous line is a sculpture that emerged from thinking about the notions of mistakes in textile. I realized that in the process of weaving, every thread of cotton is important during the process of making textile. It is not only important that the thread doesn't break, but it is important that it doesn't tumble. In February 2019, Brandon McCahey, Tino Ward, and I collaborated with a site-specific project that focused on the idea of sweeping. This task, a straightforward to be embodied, demonstrated that based on our life experiences, each body reacted to the action in very different ways. Even the intention of each body sweeping revealed the individual interests and reactions moving through the space. These images were part of an online publication by artist Michael Nunkin, where he encouraged me to interview my father to talk about the uses of drawing in his daily practice as a contractor and pool maker. Because of this interview, I understood in some way my own obsession with making straight lines and engagement with linear drawing. Using technical drawing tools, I created continuous lines to fragment and claim an area in the room. The action requires my body full physical engagement, but the technicality of the drawing hides that engagement and blurs the, and blurs the identity of those lines. This brought me to the iteration where I wanted to make a line to be buried by the final stages of a construction site. Not only the technicality of the work became relevant during the execution, but the performativity of the body was very challenged. In this documentation, I'm still very attached to the idea of my body and how I respond to specific spaces. I think about how can I reveal what gets buried under the she -rod. I use a stud finder to locate the inner structures of the wall when I utilize charcoal and graphite as a direct medium on the wall to reveal that interior structure. I think about the importance of the invisible, but while it is impossible to understand precisely how these walls, foundations, buildings, or structures are set up or by whom, I will continue to depict the truth beyond that she rock. The drawing that remains on the surface becomes a hologram of reality, a glitchy echo of its own inner construction. Under water lines is a public intervention when I wanted to mimic with the use of soil and plaster the water pipelines running under the park. Each square had a solid hard line of plastic carefully composed to create the illusion of water pipelines. The audience could navigate through them the brakes were intended to dislocate the real function of the pipes and their connectivity. So I didn't make it to the Olympics, and I don't do track and field anymore. Physical pain is still not visible to the audience. 
The endurance of my body has moved to realms where there is no limit to understanding the line from its unfolding, construction, or dislocation. So the work that I'm presenting to you today here in the gallery is also called Unfolding the Line. And it's a work that you, uh, it's a work, it's my new approach to unfolding a line. I think about the phrase like, a child can do that, right? And I imagine my inner child trying to come out and present the drawing that is abstracted. But in the game of child adult, my obsession with labor forces me to make a drawing directly on the wall that will be meant to be erased or destroyed later. That's it, thank you. And then we'll go to the next artist, if there's any. Any questions? Just to clarify, yeah? How do you, what, what inspired you to create Unfolding the Line? The ones that you see in here, the yellow one? Yes. My experience in Dallas during the summer in a residency, where we had to research about the Blackland Prairie, which is one of the natural sources in the United States that's about to disappear. It's only 1% of it alive. And the Blackland Prairie used to, ha used to host uh, all the buffaloes, bisontes, bisons in the United States and uh, natural flowers and wildflowers and medicine flowers that the indigenous people used to use. But that's only surviving in a 1%. So with this idea in mind, I wanted to, I've been thinking about this approach to drawing flowers that are meant to be destroyed or erased. So either you know by na by nature naturally or by the physical uh, addition of the human hand. Oh, uh, are there any? Is there any meaning to the different colors of lines and uh, stars? That the actually stars? the reason why I picked that yellow it's it has to do directly with the fact that I'm obsessed with construction materials, construction site materials. And this yellow, particularly this yellow chalk, is the only industrial chalk that you can find to kind of, these are the chalk that they use basically when they're building roads to mark kind of very specific things on the floor or to map out where the construction is going to happen. So I, had, I could only get white or yellow. So this is why that drawing is yellow, because of the construction side uh, chalk material. Uh, what about the other brown? Orange. And the other one there is just regular pastels that I picked, uh, kind of like a game basically. When you know, thinking as a child, trying to pick the colors that were brighter, and which is interesting for me in this process is that this is the first drawing, well, second because I did an iteration on paper, but this is the first time that I do working color. Mm -hmm. Most of my work for the past few years has been black and white, and it's been very linear. So this is kind of my way of recognizing that I can also go and explore that abstracted line in color. What do they mean? What do the lines mean to you? The lines? I think the lines are just the representation of how my hand moves. So I am very aware that if everyone here in this room were to be making a mark, each mark is going to be very different because that mark is informed by your own way of moving your body, right? Whatever you do in your daily practice, if it's either, I don't know, sweeping all day or doing ceramic all day or whatever activity that you do, when you come to the drawing line, that hand is going to carry that memory. So my lines in that wall are the memory of my own body uh, doing this kind of tedious, repetitive, laborious type of actions. Any other questions? Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. It was really a pleasure to watch her work. If you want to see how it looked before, um, follow us, Rosemary Duffy Larson Gallery, Ardell Gallery on Instagram, <laughs> and you'll see she had to encase it in plastic so that it wouldn't get all over everyone else's work, particularly Leanne's drawings, who are protecting you. 
And um, so she had to construct this whole thing, and it was just amazing to see her work all day and all night for, what, four days or some seven days? So, um, amazing. Like, for me, it was really exciting. But we have a couple of uh, pictures uh, on Instagram. Um, so, this one right here. Our next artist is Sydney K. Bowens. She was in my drawing class many years ago. I'm so proud. <laughs> on a personal note. Um, Let's welcome Sydney. These are just photos from me as a student here. Uh, and then, yeah. So hi, I'm Sydney. Um, I attended here at Colorado College from 2016 to 2019, and then I transferred to USF. My time here provided me with an incredible foundation that enabled my skills to flourish while I uh, earned my BFA at the University of South Florida. And it is ridiculously full circle to be showing my work here again and working with Angel. Um, I had a triptych my first time in a student show here, so not a whole lot has changed because I have another one today. The basis for almost all of my work are my personal experiences. Um, so I often find myself realizing that struggle cycles and moments of introspection are far more universal experiences than any of us realize in the moment. So I take those moments and expand on them in order to welcome connection and reflection from whoever comes to see this piece of work um, so they can reflect on their own experiences. Um, the altarpiece here, Be Gentle With Yourself, is actually my BFA thesis piece that did not get a lot of air time because I graduated the pandemic. So, moments on out to go to galleries. Um, this is a year and a half of research and preparation, and it's about the only thing that kept me safe while I prepared to graduate in the craziness that was 2021. Um, the starting point of this piece was something I discovered when I started therapy. Um, many of us were taught that our emotions, especially those perceived as negative, are inconvenient. Um, we're constantly told that there's something more important than what we're feeling, and you need to set them to the side and take care of them later. Um, but then later it never really comes. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so when that happens, it can lead to a whole host of odd and often unhealthy coping mechanisms just to get through this overfilled bottle. Um, if you're anything like me, you would talk pretty efficiently. Nope, I lost my spot. Uh, okay, so be gentle with yourself is not only acknowledging that struggle of having big feelings and not knowing how to take care of them, but also it's a place to reaffirm to yourself that emotions matter. They are an integral part of your being. It's an altar to self-devotion of making space for all of who you are and giving yourself permission to treat all of yourself with gentleness. I chose animals for their individual symbolism, and because emotions are often seen as thoughtless or lesser, um, or you know, base instincts, animalistic instincts. Um, not only is that wrong, but we didn't get this far as a species by ignoring our basic instincts. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are our built-in alarm system. Anger, grief, and fear are key to our ability to understand our values and where we need boundaries. This piece is an invitation to be grateful for all that our emotions do for us because when you take care of your feelings, you're really just taking care of yourself. Oh, I had more pictures than I thought. <laughs> so, uh, this next piece I made the summer after I graduated while interning with a fantastic print shop called IS Projects. They were in Fat Village, they are now in Miami. <laughs> so, some of you may be thinking, hey, the tower is a pretty intense name for some pretty sunflowers. And it is. To be completely honest, the flowers came way before the name, because I have a habit of making unintentional self-portraits of where I am at in my life. And where I was when I made this piece was very transitional. So for people who don't dabble in tarot cards, the tower is pretty universally known as the scariest, most challenging <laughs> card you can pull. 
It is literally a tower and all of its occupants coming crashing down in a huge storm. Straight up terrifying. I learned that at its core, though, that the tower is about foundational change. If your world isn't already coming down around your ears, it's letting you know that the keystone is crumbling and it's time to let go of that stuff that's not serving your growth. Change is terrifying, especially when it's from the bottom up, but it's a completely natural cycle and it is beautiful. I have seen and experienced change that wasn't centered around collapse and destruction but instead was found in gentle cycles. The traditional image didn't feel accurate to that sort of change, the kind when we're looking for the best place to put down roots. This tower, my version of the tower, is about living through cycles to find where we have the best chance to grow. And then finally we have just revisiting, which is in part made out of two previous pieces I had made, one of which won me my first ever award here in this gallery. Um, it's another space. This time, I was trying to make tangible the space we make for our relationships and how they feel once those relationships end. And it started kind of with the idea of a weird spare room in your house, and the house is you. But then it felt more like this scene from SpongeBob. <laughs> when we're in his brain and everything's on fire, and we don't know what to do with ourselves. But it's still entirely hidden in that moment, and there's the inside and the outside. <laughs> okay, so it, it, would, it was that idea, this internal space, but more like an art gallery, with snapshots and paintings and just moments of experiences and relationships. And as you change, so do those things. So do those representations of these moments and places in your life. Hindsight really packs a punch. And when a relationship ends, the way that we can see it completely transforms. When the rose-colored tints are stripped away, we see the rock that was always seeping through. And you're left confronting everything you thought it was with the reality of everything it's not. And it sucks. And I hated myself for how much time and energy I was wasting visiting this thing over and over. I think we've all been at a point where someone tells us to just let it go or move on. Um, and we feel so much pressure to ignore what was genuinely a huge, important part of our lives. We used to live in this chapter with all the rock. That was our true experience, even if we didn't see it at the time. It's value to observe, the, it's valuable, excuse me, to observe the changes in our perception as time gives us clarity. It's good to see where the rock was sinking in and why. So please don't guilt yourself for visiting those spaces when you need to. We've already lived this chapter. We have moved on. But that doesn't make coming back to see what we've learned a crime. It helps us ensure our next piece and our SpongeBob Brain Gallery can weather the elements of our life. And so we're back again to welcoming in our feelings, actively engaging in change, and learning so tomorrow can be better. Like I said, ridiculously full circle. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any questions for Sydney? Because when it comes to those three emotions, 
uh, anger and sadness or depression or grief tend to be tertiary to fear. Fear tends to be at the core drive of a lot of the other emotions that can present as us being angry or combative or scared and very withdrawn, uh, sad and very withdrawn. So he kind of got the center spot. I also deal with a lot of anxiety. So he was a big, he was a big figure in my personal touch in that piece. Um, can you explain the reasoning with um, attaching emotions to different animals? Sure. So I went, I wanted to find a visual language that kind of brought the idea of what I was saying that made the narrative um, without having to attach words to it. I wanted you to be able to spend some time with that piece and eventually figure out some boars are angry. Pigs not so much, but boars, especially floor boars, they're nasty, aggressive, and big, and just very territorial. If you get too close, they will knock you out. They do not care. Um, uh, swans have, I, I, I looked for pop culture references, things that a lot of people have access to, where mixed with some color theory and the way I portrayed them in the narrative on laser print pieces, that people could pick up, oh, this thing is angry, this thing is scared, this thing is sad, or just those kinds of hints. And then it could be whatever it needed to be for you. So it was laser print or laser print? Those are laser engraved. Okay. And then, question here. Oh, I, I noticed that you gendered That's more just, not a specific reason. I tend to gender things accidentally all the time. <laughs> Either way. And the little hair seems like a dude. I think my anxiety is a dude. <laughs> he butts into conversations. <laughs> Go for it. What gender is the bench? What gender is the what? The bench. The bench? Bench doesn't have a gender. Bench is a bench. This time. <laughs> that one didn't get a gender. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned the thing about leaving the um, sheep out in the tortoise sun. Yes. Do you feel like Florida or just like where you live has had any impact on your art? Absolutely. Yes. yes. Uh, the kinds of references I reach for yeah, are like, the yes. board. <laughs> uh, the, the kinds of media I was exposed to and the day to day, and you know, you're in Florida, so people brought up like you know way more about Florida history than anybody who was ever born in Florida. Mm -hmm. Stuff, that stuff tends to seep through a lot of the kind of imagery I use. Definitely. Anybody else? Thank you, Sydney. <laughs>
um, working class, uh, queer, uh, Haitian, female immigrant, is um, operates in three modes depicting the history of capitalism, imperialism, and racism. How these social economic systems continue to oppress and exploit today, and the possible futures beyond the horizons of capitalism. Though I tend to focus mainly on painting, I work across mediums when needed in order to better communicate my message. Recognizing the global working class colossal power and unbridled potential, I understand art as a crucial educational and mobilizing tool in the struggle to build the world we deserve. One where providing for the needs, well-being, and rights of the people and other life forms of earth are central. In the insatiable capitalist hunger for profit, a nightmare of the past. In the tradition of artists such as Riva Helfam, Emery Douglas, and Diego Rivera, I memorialize past struggles alongside powerful visions of progress and others to create dialogue and inspire people to organize and take actions around social, economic, and ecological issues. So after graduating from BC, I transferred to um, the California College of the Arts, where I basically took the tool, um, the foundation that I learned here, and learned to use them as tools for education and to talk about the struggles and to um, organize. And then also I was inspired by a lot of the movements in the Bay Area. Um, I don't know if you all know, but the Bay Area is known for um, the free speech movement, um, the movement for the Black Panther Party in 67, also um, the free love um, movement. Um, as well as like they were, uh, the students at F FS State were the first one to fall and strike to have ethnic studies in, in schools in the U.S. And also now they have the largest academic worker strike in history going on. So this, a lot of those impacted my work. After graduating from CCA, I went to um, UC Berkeley. UC Berkeley, uh, the University of California Berkeley, um, was an interdisciplinary program where I got to basically explore a lot of different things that I was seeing my friends doing and really wanted to try and put my hands out. So things like sculpture and ceramic, as well as performance, which I have a slide to go into that, and as well as, as sounds, as you can tell from the work um, in there. Um, I have created these vessels that were inspired by the Haitian Mala drums um, in a very, very um, sad and isolated time in my life. I started the program at UC Berkeley in the middle of the pandemic, and just like <laughs> you, I was um, isolated, all of my classes were online, and I had a lot of family and griefs and debts, and I couldn't come back to South Florida. And so, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and so I felt like creating these vessels for me was a way of bringing my ancestors to um, across the continent um, to be with me in the Bay Area. And I first used the vessels as healing vessels, where I put medicinal plants inside of them, um, and then later um, added sounds. Um, some of them got broken before firing, some of them got broken after installation, and some of them got broken during the transit here to BC. Um, and I decided to keep um, the one in there that's broken because I thought it was such a great symbolism of putting so much work and effort and your dream into something and then having it go into the system and having it be shattered, but not being um, giving up hope from it, but using it as a tool to still talk about the things that are going on. And so, thank you, Angel, <laughs> for your support and for allowing me to show that. Um, so, I talk about the three different modes in my work. And so, I decided to create this costume 
where um, I wanted to use different costumes to represent the different stages of you know the oppression, exploitation, the also the fight for liberation, but also this hope for building a future that we all deserve. And so the one up with the black and white is called Rising. I think of it of as coming to consciousness of realizing um, the things that are going on. And the warrior version on the bottom is for me um, the organization and fighting back for what we deserve. And then um, hope on the side with the colorful that's inspired by Haitian Carnival <laughs> where um, it's about really coming together with nature and building the world that we deserve. Um, and so I also um, collaborated with members of my community to create um, poems in which they were translated to nine different languages. And then to that, I used it to make a sound um, that I used for the warrior performance and used that along with a friend of mine, Robinson Maturin, who's a choreographer in New York, to um, create a choreography for the warrior one. And then after doing all of these things of like working with sculpture, breaking them, <laughs> um, bringing performance into the mix, um, I um, went back to painting. So I had the chance of creating these pieces that was moving through the healing and actually talking about the things that I saw in, um, during COVID. COVID to me brought a lot of the contradiction of our system to the surface. While, you know, people were losing their homes and I, I don't know, in the Bay Area, homelessness is such a huge issue. Um, and it's like, it's like you really see the, the wealth and then the deprivation, like right next to each other. It's so hard to like not be able to see it. It's, stri it's like striking. Um, and then to see, you know, food going away so while people were standing in line, yet the billionaires were going into space. And things were still going on as if we were not in crisis. And so I really wanted to kind of use, you know, all the things that were going on around me, kind of like a, a archive of these experiences of working class experience and contradiction that were happening to talk about this. But I didn't want to only bring to the surface those contradictions and talk about the problems that we have. I also wanted to envision the possible futures of why is it that we are fighting? Why, why are we organizing? Why are we fighting? So for my thesis show at Benfa, I decided to combine the ceramic vessels that for me were a tool of healing with these new pictures of, um, of like possible vision of future. I live in Oakland and in um, the East Bay. And I use a landscape of Oakland. Oakland is like, you know, riddled with, with cement and highways. There's not a lot of greenery around, which I completely didn't enjoy well. And I wanted to kind of go back and think about well, what if, you know, instead of highways, there were um, green belts and there were trails and there was um, greenery all around. And instead of like just grass, there were trees. And, you know, instead of these empty buildings um, that just sat empty to make other people profit, what if, you know, they were redistributed for the community, for people to live in? Um, and then I also made this sculptural structure that acted as a barrier to this vision of a possible future that symbolized the present structure and the constraint that we face today to be able to attain that future. And then after graduating, I, um, well, throughout my program I was teaching, and then after graduating at UC Berkeley, I did a postdoc. I'm, I'm currently doing a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of San Francisco, where I get to teach and educate others, where I get to take the um, the tools that I've learned and pass it on to others, right? Because I know by myself, 
I don't know if I'm going to see the future I'm imagining, but it's, it, it gives me a lot of hope to know that I can train other people to continue fighting for that future. And so one of the final projects that we're doing is they get to propose to me two to three issues that they're dealing with right now and propose two to, two, uh, two to three solutions. And then the final project that we're working on is for them to imagine a future and to create it where those things no longer is, exist. Now, we're not trying to build utopias, of course, so we do a lot of research um, to see things that already are being implemented worldwide because a lot of the problems uh, the solution to our problems already exists. And so we try to go ahead and, and bring those things into the work that we're making. And then finally, my own practice, I'm also re, um, continuing this uh, idea of building this vision of possible future, where I take um, pictures of different cities and go in and kind of add greenery to it. And some of them I add like, you know, clinics, um, preventative healthcare, um, food distribution, things. And um, think about like what would a green sustainable, sustainable um, city would look like. And those are, are a lot of things that I talk to with my students. And so lastly, I want to say thank you so much for having me back. Um, it's such a great experience to be here, and it's such an honor to come back to my home base. Um, I feel like I've never, throughout my career, ever found any place that's as supportive and giving as Bart um, College. And the, the BCs do confuse me sometimes. <laughs> and then I want to thank all the educators, and especially Angel, for all the support I've received over the years. Um, I often tell you I would not be able to make it this far without your help, and I do mean that. And then lastly, I want to thank my friends and family for always supporting me and for being here tonight. Thank you. Any questions for Rivka? Questions? Oh, wait, this question back there. Yeah, that's such a great question. Thank you for asking that. I think making work in the pandemic where I was talking about masses of people and I wanted to collaborate with people and didn't know how. And then sound was a way for me to bring people into my pieces, to bring different voices to collaborate with my community. It's funny because the first collaboration I did, I did with people who were in Namibia, who were in Germany, who were like not local. And it was because of the pandemic where I was like, oh my god, I want, a, I want voices, I want people, I want their presence to be felt. And then I was like, why don't I make a sound of, of the voices coming together? And because of the pandemic and, and Zoom, <laughs> was able to reach out to people from all over. And that has stayed with me and something that I want to continue implementing in my work. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, fine. <laughs> um, the style of your paintings is really, really amazing. I was wondering, like, what techniques you use? They almost look like collages, but also painting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of different process that goes into them. Um, I, of course, I find the work that I want to use. Sometimes I do collages, and I, in the past, I've done transfers um, onto wood, um, and then paint on top of that, and then. Well, the transfer is interesting because when you transfer and you rub away, you're also rubbing away some of the of the transfer that you're doing. And so going back in with the painting has been for me, like, I do think of the transfer as, like, the drawing, you know? And then, um, so I think I've also had a very strong foundation in drawing, which has helped me a lot in my painting. I was an undergrad at CCA, and 
and, and the painting and drawing um, program, and most of the painters didn't know how to draw. So I was very lucky to have that, because I think having that skill as a foundation has helped me to be a lot more clear about the things that I want to say, and not just kind of leave it up to chance, if that makes sense. And I do use like acrylic, oil, um, graphite in a lot of different mediums. Okay, yes, that's a great one. Um, I think videography is something I've dabbled in, but like, I don't know, they say that painters make really great films, so I kind of want to try that out. Um, and then also, like, I did start to do a lot of performance art, and that's something I want to kind of go in more into it. Yeah, I want to thank my mom for putting me in dance at a very young age. <laughs> and so that's, that keeps coming up a lot, so I definitely want to go back in and kind of do that. Especially when I talk about Haiti, I feel like it's such a great medium for like translating a lot that I can't say with words or through visualization of a, a painting. Yes, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> Continuously get darker. 
So next was Hell Above. Um, I made this drawing and response again. You'll notice that's kind of a trend. I look at it and I'm like, what does this need next? So Hell Above, I made it because I was looking at it, I don't remember everything, and I thought to myself, this is too perfect. <laughs> it's too right. I'm using too much photographic reference. I'm looking too much at Lucian Freud. I need to <laughs> remove all of this from my pack. So I made this drawing completely from memory. There's no photographic reference, it's just from memory. Um, and there's things that are wrong about it, and I love it, right? I've noticed that I love the things that are wrong. I love the things that are inherently wrong with memory. So at this point, I wanted to make this cool bedroom, right? I needed to make this space. So I came across this painting, Interior, otherwise known as The Break by Degas, and I fell in love with it. I fell in love with this investigation that happened when I looked at it. I love the shadow that was behind it, this impossibly large shadow, this figure blocking the door, and this hunched over figure, right? She's almost undressed, she's dressed, and a fully made bed that's pristine and not touched, right? So what is this event? Did it happen yet? Is it going to happen? Has it already happened? Right? This line of questioning is something that I was very interested in. So I made this diptych, right? A piece of this diptych is actually in the show. Um, and what I love about this diptych is I think I captured that, right? I captured that line of questioning, especially when they're together, right? When they're together, it creates this narrative. You wonder what happened. You look at the titles, you see your shadow. I feel like that implicates you as a viewer, right? You are entering the room. You are the perpetrator. So, again, I look at this drawing, I feel satisfied with it. Something needs to change, though. This is completely from imagination. Let's go back to photography. <laughs> Specifically, my mom's photography. So, this is a photo my mom took of my dad and I at the pool together, and I thought, I need to draw this. I don't know why yet, but I need to draw it. So, I made it. I drew it. And something I loved from working from a family photo, this was the first time, was I could distort details. I could pick out what I wanted to change. I could pick out what I wanted to add. It was amazing, right? So I could take this photo that seems somewhat childlike and somewhat fun and turn it into something ominous, right? I can make this about the relationship I have with my father. I can make this about the pressure that is put on my father. So again, I want to switch modes again. I go back to my job. <laughs> so um, this is actually created from a story from my father. So he has this story of a canary, a bird, in um, his father's house, my grandfather's house. And he told me this lofty story while we were on a trip in Massachusetts. And I was infatuated with it. I could not step away. I had to listen to it. Sometimes our dads tell stories like that. And I made this drawing and I showed it to my family. My dad's like, I recognize it. That's the story without me even saying anything. My mom looks at it and she says, that's not the type of bird. <laughs> that's not the paneling that was on the walls. The tree wasn't that close to the window, right? So again, memory is inherently flawed, right? Not just mine, my father's as well. I have to go finally. <laughs> and I made this piece this semester. Um, and what I love about this one is that it's not just one memory. It's a layer and layer, layer, layer upon memory. So some of the memories that are in here is Hurricane Ian. A tree collapsed in my neighborhood and blocked it so no one could leave. Um, a story from my father. He used to put his uh, lamp under his pillow because his father was a firefighter and he wanted him to come home. So it's several memories, several times, all layered upon each other. It's not plausible, but yet it works somehow. It's magical. And this is kind of the last of that craziness, right? Super crazy. Any memory that was coming into my head, I put into this one. So I stole a little bit from Kath Colwitz. I put one of her woodblock prints up there. I stole a little bit for myself having COVID over the summer and no longer being able to breathe. I put drawings of my friends in there. Just stacks, layers and layers and layers of memories. And I'm looking a lot at Jenny Seville and a lot at Francis Bacon, if you can't tell. <laughs> um, all of these artists influence me all the time. I love all the craziness. But again, I want to go back to plausible space. So I make the story of my mother. It's actually changed a bit from now. Um, but I, what I like about this one, in comparison to the drawing of my father and I, 
is that although this is plausible, and although it's seemingly innocent, there's something off-putting about this, right? Every time someone steps in front of this, they say, I know it's your mom, but I'm a little uncomfortable. <laughs> so I like that, right? It's, it makes you uncomfortable to look at this, right? You can tell that there's something wrong with this memory without me having to say a word. And this is where I'm at now. This is the drawing that I finished recently. Um, again, I wanted to work at a different scale, so this is a completely different width and a completely different height. This is a very large drawing. It takes over the room. Um, and I wanted to make something of a figure that was almost absent, right? So if you look really quickly at this, um, some people have said it looks like a tick, right? You can't even tell it's a figure. So I'm working now with the idea of how do I omit the figure with keeping the figure, right? So that's kind of where I'm at now. Um, any questions? Questions for the end? So what, what draws you to charcoal? So I've been working at charcoal since I was itty bitty bitty. Um, my mom used to give me art lessons in the garage where we would draw trees with charcoal. So I kind of always just keep end up going back there. It's my first love, I have to learn. <laughs> um, how do you approach a drawing that that It's actually way easier. <laughs> that's, that's the question I get most often. Um, I struggle to draw small. It's really hard. I work very gestural. I have to use my whole body to draw. Um, it's, this is actually much faster than my smaller drawings. Believe it or not, this is three days of work. It's it's a lot faster to draw big. I don't know how else to explain it. You just gotta do it, and then you understand. <laughs> okay, for the drawing of is the face. What what about it? Like you said something. Yes. But your mom's face looks weird. Yes, it does look weird. Um, so when I finished this, I actually noticed, um, so I love anatomy, I study anatomy. I feel very confident in my anatomy skills. Um, but I noticed that I rendered her almost like a paper doll. Mm -hmm. And I decided to not go back into it. Not go back into it and fix it. Her face looks shattered. That's what like, yes. Her face looks shattered. Yes. It's rendered completely differently than the rest of my figures. Thank you. Thank you.